You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature podcast series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business leaders. To help make sense of these topics and how they'll unfold, we'll sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best at the conference board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the conference board and the host of this podcast series. And today's conversation will focus on the US healthcare system. What's the current state of healthcare in the United States and what's working, what's not working? How can we lower costs and improve outcomes? Joining me today is Dr. Stephen Miller, He's a renowned physician, nationally recognized advocate on health issues, formerly was the chief medical officer for Express Scripts, and now is Cigna's chief clinical officer. Dr. Miller, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Steve. So, you know, talk a little bit, a minute or so on your, on your background so that our listeners know your, you know, your experience is just, it's just phenomenal. Yeah, so uh, it goes back quite a way. So when I, I went straight from high school into medical school, and then part of my training is I did internal medicine. I've done a research cardiology fellowship, a research cancer fellowship, a clinical and research fellowship in nephrology, hypertension, and transplantation. Went on to become faculty at Washington U for most of my career. And so I was a traditional academician doing Uh, teaching, research, patient care, transitioned to start a business for Wash U in kidney disease. It's about dialysis. So I started a dialysis business that became the largest in the state of Missouri. Uh, From there, I became the chief medical officer from the hospital, then was recruited to Express Scripts. And then when Cigna bought Express Scripts, they kept me on as the chief medical officer for both organizations. So I've had perspective as a provider, as a uh, payer, uh, as a researcher, and uh, so really span the full spectrum of healthcare. Yeah, and, and now you're, you know, you're really in the business of healthcare, which, which makes you just, the, you know, the perfect person to comment on, you know, what's going on today. You know, uh, Dr. Miller, we can, you know, you can hardly start one of these conversations on healthcare without talking about COVID-19. It is just a uh, you know, sort of uh, dominated our lives for the past uh, couple of years. Can you just, you know, give us your your view on where we are with this pandemic and, uh, you know, and what do you think is going to come next? Yeah, so as you know, we're now going to enter the third year of the pandemic. So it's two years ago now that Wuhan was, you know, experiencing tremendous number of cases. We actually have people in 30 different countries. I have 1,500 people in Wuhan. So we've been dealing with this now pretty, uh, you know, daily since uh, December of 19. Right now, as you know, the Omicron variant is really becoming the predominant variant across the world. Uh, In New Jersey, for instance, 15% of all new isolates are Omicron. And so the anticipation is, is that because Omicron does not respond as well to the vaccines, we're gonna see a tremendous spike, probably peaking in January in the United States. And we have a fatigued uh, healthcare system. We've lost many employees in the healthcare system. So this is really gonna be a challenge for us this winter. Yeah, is, is, so the, the Omicron different, uh, variant is different than Delta. You know, it's easier to spread, but it's not quite as, um, as uh, virulent of a disease. Uh, is, is that a, an apt description? Yeah, so the variant that wins is the one that actually spreads the fastest. It's not the one that's actually the most lethal. So it's the one that can spread better. And Delta, we thought, was really efficient at spreading. Omicron is even more efficient at spreading. And so that's why it's rapidly taking over as the dominant strain. You look in not just South Africa, but that's already true in the UK and will be true in much of Europe in the near future. And because of the foothold it has in the United States, we anticipate that will happen here. The good news to your point is that it doesn't seem to cause as severe an illness, 
But when you think about the number of people that are susceptible, because we who are vaccinated uh, can get reinfected, it still has the potential to overwhelm the healthcare system. And so the good news is, is that the disease won't be as bad for people. The bad news is the numbers could be quite high and the system could be really challenged. You know, it, it is one way to look at this, and you know, I know it's early days, and you never know on these things. Uh, you know, but I'm always seeking to to look at things as a glass half full. You know, is one way to think about it that you know maybe this variant, because it spreads the easiest, it will become the most dominant, and because it's not as lethal, that maybe it will. You know, we we will be able to adjust and be able to live with it as a society, more like we live with the common cold and the you know the annual flu. Yeah, so I think it's worse than the common cold or the annual flu, but to your point, you know, we're going to have to learn to live with these things no matter what. And so there's a big debate going on right now, to your point, should we actually have Omicron specific vaccines or not, or should we let this run? Because remember, we're not safe until we're all safe. And our ability to vaccinate the world has been shown to be pretty, uh, you know, subpar. And so a lot of people believe that getting native immunity by letting this run may be the best thing to do. Let me caveat that though. Everyone should get vaccinated. Everyone should get a booster because the reality is, is that if you get sick, you'll be far less sick. So you really want it to be mild. So it does not take away the need to get vaccinated and boosted. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what do the virologists say about, uh, you know, the possibility of, of future variants, uh, you, you know, because it, I don't know, there, there's, there are more letters in the Greek alphabet, so I assume there can be more variants. Yeah, so this is the problem with not being able to vaccinate the world, or even the United States particularly well, is yeah. that actually leads to a foothold for variants to develop. And so that's why the importance of get vaccinated, get boosted, and then hopefully you'll have, if you get infected or reinfected, it'd be a mild case. And hopefully we can get through this winter. And as you know, these are uh, winter viruses. That is, they spread the best when we're indoors and we're not wearing masks. And so there's actually good advice for people. That is, do the things you know work. Wear a mask when indoors. Be very careful when you have your mask off, like in restaurants and other settings. Uh, and then get vaccinated, get boosted, and then obviously the good hand hygiene. And if you feel sick, stay at home. Yeah, that's that's really great common sense advice. Okay, so we got to go back to the healthcare system. You know, you mentioned that uh, the the real worry here is that Omicron or any variant here overwhelms the healthcare system, and we want to be able to handle you know not only COVID but everything else <laughs> that happens in the healthcare system. But, you know, our healthcare system has evolved a lot. You know, ACA, the, Ameri uh, the Affordable Care Act was uh, enacted in 2010. Just talk about where we are with that. You know, what were the original goals? And, uh, and now 11, or I guess it's now a dozen years later, how are we doing against those goals? Yeah, so if you remember, it was the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act back then. And at the time, we were spending about $2.6 trillion a year in healthcare, and we had about 50 million people who were uninsured. And it had two goals. Goal number one was to make healthcare available, affordable, and acceptable. That is, we wanted to really make uh, it, you know, we wanted to make uh, the benefit so that people could use their benefit. We wanted to make more availability through having what are called essential benefits. That is uh, things where people didn't have to pay co-pays to use emergency rooms and other things. And we wanted it to be acceptable. That is, we wanted to have high quality. And then the second goal was to slow the growth and bend the curve. We used to hear this term all the time. Unfortunately, as you know, the numbers that just came out from CMS in the last couple of days is we've gone from 2.6 trillion to 4.1 trillion. And we're going, and we are now spending almost 19.7% of GDP on healthcare. Now, the good news is we have fewer uninsured patients. And so we're down to 31.2. We'd gotten to as low as 28 million people uninsured prior to COVID. We're up to 31.2 but that's still much better than 50 million. So if you think about those goals, have we made it more accessible, affordable, acceptable? 
Uh, not a good score there. And if we, have, if we look at bending the curve, have we done a good job there? Not a good score there. We really are struggling. You know, if, if I recall back a dozen years ago, I, I used, you laid out the goals, but we had about 30 or 40 million uninsured people at that time. And so this was supposed to provide universal health care coverage and essentially push the costs back you know, on, on everybody else to cover the, the people that, uh, that were uncovered at that time. I just scratch my head and wonder, you know, in retrospect, whether we shouldn't have just expanded, uh, you know, other, other forms of, of health care, you know, Medicare and so forth to, to cover these people. You know, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but, but now we're still with, you know, with, with, you know, tens of millions of people uncovered. What do we do next? Yeah, so as you know, and it's even included in Build Back Better, the president is continuing to try to expand coverage for people that are uninsured. As you know, uh, because this bill was passed by reconciliation and they were not able to go back and fix it, there were many flaws with the Affordable Care Act and we're paying the consequence for that. So many of the ideas that were supposed to go into place to bend the cost curve never took place. Much of the Medicare expa Medicaid expansion that was supposed to occur didn't occur. And so we're, we've been left with a foot in both camps. And as you know, when you're in that situation, you usually not only aren't achieving your goals, but you're actually costing more than usual. So we have to really re-examine what we're going to do going forward, because doing the same is truly the, you know, the definition of insanity. You know, a, a lot of our members kind of scratch their head, you know, as, especially those that are not in the healthcare, healthcare world. And they say, well, you know, there wasn't coverage pre-ACA for those tens, you know, those, those millions of people, but they got treated, you know, either in urgent care centers or hospitals, which, which gave them treatment. And gee, weren't we better off then when everybody was getting treated and the costs were lower than where we are now? Yeah, the big problem is that when people are not invited into the healthcare system, their outcomes are much worse. And so if we look at patients who back then either Medicare or Medicaid versus commercial insurance, their outcomes were not as good. And COVID has actually made this even more evident with the disparity of care for COVID. And so uh, the goals are laudable. We still actually have this big gap in outcomes. And the question is, how can we actually move to a system that is as innovative as the U.S. system, but it becomes more affordable? Yeah, and and so you know, your point then is having people run to ERs, emergency rooms, and hospitals is probably the most expensive way to deal with anything. You know, you don't want to be treating sore throats there. You want to be dealing with, you know, with urgent uh, with urgent issues, trauma issues. So having people in the system, you know, helps you know, drive preventive care, uh, you know, and, and all of the things that lead up and, and, and hopefully prevent, you know, worse situations. I, that, that's what you mean by better outcomes, right? Well, you know, we currently sponsor a sick care system, not a health care system. And so the reality is until we actually convert to a health care system where we're providing prenatal care, early childhood care, preventative care, we're going to continue to fight this escalating cost. Yeah, and, and, and that includes vaccinations, you know, COVID and, and everything else and, uh, it, you know, and, and just good, good practices. We have been talking about uh, the, the rising costs of health care and the system and COVID and, you know, what we've learned from that. Next, we're going to explore uh, a little bit more about what makes the, the system great in the U.S. And, and what else we need to do to make it even better. We'll be right back after a short break. As war rages in Ukraine, the Conference Board is closely monitoring the situation and producing timely and relevant content on a daily basis that will help the business community navigate this global geopolitical unrest. What will the impact be on oil prices, food prices, our supply chain, and what about cybersecurity? How will this conflict impact the way your organization does business around the world, and how will you communicate this crisis to customers and employees? We're gathering the very latest content on our website. Just head to conference-board.org and find trusted insights to help you and your team lead with confidence. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by Dr. Stephen Miller, the Chief Clinical Officer of Cigna. 
So, Steve, we were talking before the break about uh, about uh, COVID and and about uh, the system, and you know, you want wellness in the system. What really drives? What, why is art? You know, you mentioned what over four trillion dollars now. Twenty percent of our GDP is spent. Why is our system so expensive? You hear elsewhere in the world that uh, that they are they're doing great, and you know, they have lower costs, and and here we are, and we have the most expensive system in the world. Yeah, so I think the number one driver in the U.S. is actually we're the fastest healthcare system in the world. So let me give you an example. You know, if you need an MRI scan in the United States, you can probably get one within 24 hours. We have 40 MRI scanners per million people in the United States. If you just go north of the border to Canada, they have 10 MRI scanners per person. Now, the difference is this. If you need an emergency MRI, that is, you come in and you have paralysis, you're going to get one right away in the United States. But in Canada, you're also going to get one right away. The difference is if you have an elective need, that is something that can wait. In the U.S., you're going to get it within 24, 48 hours. In Canada, you may have to wait six weeks, three months. And so the reality is, is we have a really fast healthcare system which means we have to have extraordinary amount of capacity to be able to act that quick. So that's both good because patients and our culture is we want our health care fast, but we pay a lot for that privilege. The second place where we're the best is when you are really sick, if you have cancer, if you need a transplant, if you have a personalized medical issue, we're really good at those things. And the third thing we're really good at is we're the most innovative healthcare system in the world. When you think about drugs, if you think about the vaccines for COVID, where do they all come from? Almost all of them were invented here. So we have some extraordinary assets that make us the best in some regards. On the flip side, we don't provide great outcomes. We don't do population health really well. And so that really drags on the system. So not only are we not getting good population statistics, but we're doing it at a cost that no one else can match. You know, and, and that leads to all of these pre-existing conditions and, uh, and comorbidities, which has made, you know, the pandemic, the, the COVID-19 virus that much more dangerous. And if we had, as you said, uh, instead of a sick, a sick care system, a well care system or a health system you know maybe we as a society would be able to battle some of these uh viruses and and you know other other issues more easily huh well you know we've given up on personal responsibility and we've shown this in covid right the willingness to help each other in society get vaccinated be masked uh social distance but we also show this in many other diseases right we don't exercise we eat too much we smoke too much. And so personal responsibility in the U.S. is actually less than many other societies where there's more of a social norm. And so Americans are fiercely independent, but we actually pay a price for that. And COVID has really brought that to bear. You know, um, you mentioned Canada before, and, and it's interesting that, I, you know, I hadn't heard you know that description. And it, I, it's really an interesting one where, you know, in terms of urgent care or tra tra trauma care, the systems are roughly comparable, but but in in terms of anything elective or or less urgent, we're you know we, we provide the capacity, which means we can get to it faster. And and everywhere else, you got to get in line. Do you you know looking around the world, as I know you have, you know to other systems or or other models. Do you do you see any other uh, models that you like and that could potentially be adopted here? Yeah, so remember, uh, healthcare costs are climbing everywhere, and every country is starting to struggle with healthcare costs. And so, uh, healthcare will consume as many dollars as we're willing to put into it. Different systems have different attributes that may make them better. So, we've talked about some of the attributes that make ours really desirable. And especially for those of us who have assets, this system works pretty well. But if you look at the Scandinavian countries, for instance, where they have more equitable care across the board, they get better population outcomes. They also have a more homogeneous population, which makes it easier to uh, treat this, the uh, population. And so when I look at different countries, each of them has some good and bad to their system. 
And so I'm a big believer in a free market. I believe free markets actually will give you the most innovation. The issue is we need to challenge our free market with with the affordability. We are not as innovative when it comes to coming up with new things that drive down costs. So I'm going to expand on this just one more second, and that is we need to replatform U.S. healthcare. Our productivity in healthcare is the same now as it was 100 years ago. In most other industries, that's changed. We need to change healthcare in that way. You know, when, when you and I were both younger, um, the, the treatments were a lot simpler. I mean, you know, we had penicillin, you know, for a bacterial infection. You took aspirin and it was literally aspirin. Uh, you know, if you had a headache, you set broken bones, but, you know, there weren't the MRI machines, you know, there weren't, you know, and all these technologies, there weren't these, these genetically sculpted drugs and so forth. And so the treatments were also cheaper. They were simpler and they were cheaper. They weren't as, you know, they, they obviously weren't as targeted. They weren't as efficacious, but, but how much of the cost uh, in our system, let's just say in our lifetimes have, has been driven by the technology and the advances in, in medical science. Oh, no, that's a huge factor in the cost of health care. And as you know, in America, that's what I mean by if you really have a serious illness, this is the country you want to be. We're really good at sort of the, you know, end of life care or when you get that serious illness as you get older. And the trouble is that doesn't move your statistics for survival. Adding six months of life or two years of life isn't as effective as prenatal care and early childhood care where I add 75, 80 years of productive life. So many other countries focus on the, the earlier side of the system. We focus on sick care, not health care. And so that's why we drive down the, up the cost. But I will tell you that culturally, Americans really like that. And our culture is spreading throughout the world. The number of you know, gene therapies and targeted therapies that are being requested by people around the world is going through the roof right now. And that's why other countries are starting to struggle also. Our, our politicians today seem to like to beat up uh, drug companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies for you know, the high cost and, and blame it on, on the pharmaceutical business. I'm not sure everybody understands the business model there and the amount that it takes to put into R&D and so forth. You know, give us a, you know, a two minute primer on the pharmaceutical industry and why some of these drug costs are so high. Yeah, so the unit cost for everything in America is higher than it is elsewhere. The physician cost, the hospital cost, and the pharmacy cost. And through that, we are subsidizing the rest of the world. So we're 4.6% of the world's population. When it comes to drugs, we're about 30% of drug spend, but we're somewhere between 50 and 70% of drug profitability. We, just like we subsidize world defense, we choose to subsidize world healthcare innovation. And there is no more innovative industry than the pharmaceutical industry. And so they have responded appropriately. They have high margins, but they also have, you know, high value. They are the ones that came up with the COVID vaccines, the COVID therapeutic agents. And so it's really important that we actually have a balance of affordability, but also innovation. And that's why I like a free market system, but we need better guardrails than we have today. And we need to replatform this. So, in, so in your opinion, you know, the, you know, what would you say to these politicians? How would you just, how would you get these politicians to understand, you know, why certain drug therapies are so expensive and, and, you know, the, and what would you say to those politicians who say, you know, it should just be given free? We know we're moving into an era of more personalized care. And when you have more personalized care, you're treating smaller and smaller populations. We now have drugs that are coming to the market that are truly designed to treat hundreds, if just a couple thousand people. If you think about the R&D and the capital you need to do that, it's extraordinary. And so now, you know, part of the problem is our drug costs don't go down as fast as they should. When you produce a fighter jet, that first edition of the fighter jets, the most expensive, and over time it comes down. The quirk in the US system is that our first edition is really expensive, but the price goes up over time. And so we need to actually figure out how do we actually keep those prices from rising the way they do. And I believe that the Build Back Better 
uh, Act actually has some things that will help, but it actually has some things that will actually really hurt that. And so we don't really have a Congress or a, you know, a legislator, sure, that's willing to work together to solve these things, because these are really tough problems. We need to have adult conversations, uh, but there are solutions out there. Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, the Moderna CEO was talking about the vaccine for COVID and how it, it wasn't a couple of month process. It was a 10 year development right. process and investment, and they lost money for 10 years just on the myRNA technology that then when COVID reared its ugly head, they, they were able to apply uh, very quickly. And so people are saying, well, and I think this is what people miss. I mean, you know, pharmaceutical companies are spending, you know, what, 15 to 18% of their sales in, in research and development every year. And the patent protection is very short. So they have to make their money to pay that out in a very short period of time, or else they couldn't afford to do the kind of research that they do. So, so it's really a business model issue, um, you know, that we have. Well, but I'll push back a little bit. That is, we see a variability within the pharmaceutical industry. There are some companies that are phenomenally responsible. And when you think about it, there's a social contract. That is, if I have something that's in high demand and we, I make, uh, there's a social contract in healthcare that we're not supposed to gouge. That social contract has kind of frayed over time. Let me give you a really good example. If you look at the erectile dysfunction drugs, and I choose these because there's no rebates, there's no discounts at all. This is sold directly to consumers. When Viagra came out, it was $7 a tablet. When it lost its patent, it was $50 a tablet. Why should that happen? And so that's not really responsible leadership when we have things like that happen because it didn't get more expensive to produce over time and there was no more research going into it but they take those profitability and they put it into other areas of their company. And so we have to strike a balance because we have to have affordability in two ways. One is the copay, what the patient sees has to be affordable, but B, it has to be affordable to everyone because when the other costs get passed on to the employer, it just shows up in the form of either higher premiums or higher copay, you know, you have to push those costs somewhere. And so we need a more affordable system. And this is why I keep coming back to what I talk about. We need to re-platform healthcare. There, one third of all healthcare costs are waste. We have enough money in healthcare. If we can actually drive that waste out, we can pay for all the great new things we want to pay for. That's interesting that you say it that way. So, you know, Dr. Mill, if you had a magic wand, and this was a Harry Potter movie, <laughs> How would you wave it and, and what would you change? You know, what, what is the, you know, the, the magic solution here? Yeah, so I keep uh, mentioning how to re-platform healthcare. We need to meet patients where they want to be met. I'll give you an example. Many patients are fine with just true digital interactions, not even virtual interactions. So I can actually work with you, text messaging you, treat many of your conditions that when you don't need to have a physical exam done or lab testing, and that is really inexpensive. Let me give you an example. If a woman has a urinary tract infection, they know exactly what they have. They would love to be able to text their doctor and say, I have a UTI, a urinary tract infection. They would love to receive a text back from their doctor that says, stop by this lab, to get to drop off your urine sample, and then I will have delivered to either your office or home your antibiotic. That interaction would cost literally a few dollars versus right now that person has to take time off from work and go to either an urgent care center that's going to cost her a couple hundred dollars or even worse, an emergency room that may cost a thousand dollars. That's what I mean by replatforming healthcare. And then if you need more than that, can you be seen virtually? So over a you know, secure Zoom type call, and then those patients that need to be seen in person, we also have that. But we have not developed a system like that. We haven't taken advantage of the technology. And if I can scrape off the easiest cases and treat them either digitally or virtually, I can save so much money to reinvest in those who actually need a higher level of care. 
That's what I mean by replatforming. And we need legislation and regulations that encourage this, don't block that type of activity. Wow, that is just such great common sense. Um, I wish you had a magic wand because uh, I'd love to see that system that you, uh, that you would create. Dr. Miller, we're going to have to have you back because there's just so much to talk about uh, in our healthcare system. And, and you, know, you understand it uh, better than most, but thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's, it's been a real pleasure. And, and thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every few weeks, I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover leading topics in economics, public policy, ESG, human capital, and more. Please share CEO Perspectives with everyone you know, because I know they want to listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this podcast has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You've been listening to a podcast from the Conference Board, your source of trusted insights for what's ahead. For the latest insights to help guide your business through this time of geopolitical unrest, we have daily and relevant updates on our website at conference-board.org.